Hello, everyone. It's Friday. Welcome back to another episode of Kingdom Speak. Today is going to be another great episode, as you are well accustomed to on Kingdom Speak. Today, we're going to talk uh, about verbal being, the man, the minister. Welcome to Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop and Nita Hodges. I, I didn't want to say anything, but last week it was just the two of us. Smooth as silk. There was such a spirit of unity in the room. Yes, yes, there was. And, uh, is this where I grabbed my microphone <laughs> off the floor? <laughs> okay, he noticed. I oh, put his microphone on the, on the floor. Yes. I did it. I did, did it. <laughs> <laughs> I almost unplugged it, actually. Oh. Uh, well, and he puts it back. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like, like this. I kind of like this. This is mm-hmm. good. Welcome yeah. back. We're Thank glad you. to it's have good to be you back. back. Welcome back. So, how was it last week? It was great. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was different. Yeah, it was different. Yeah. We missed you, Randy. We missed you. Oh, they we really need so you. Much. Oh, yeah, we do. Yes. I hate to Did say you hear it. that voice? Mm-hmm. And then there was another guest at the table. Yes, mm-hmm. we've so. got her here uh-huh. in the wings, yeah. so that the next time. Yeah. That Randy ah. Gallivant. Yes. Yeah. You know your technology is mm-hmm. safe with me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So just yes. watch what he does, so, and yeah. you can fill in for him at any yeah. time. When Got it. He, yeah. Got it. This <laughs> is like a, just a general question. I'm, out of everybody sitting here, who who would travel the least? Well, who, but, who would be gone? No, no. But no, uh, let me let me rephrase. Yeah, yeah. I think who you need would, to rephrase. That. Who would be gone the least? Like mm. or how about this? Who misses the most recordings? Mm. Well, we know that one already. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, yes. yeah. We Are you do. trying to defend yourself? No, no. That was okay. just a question oh, right. for our That's audience. That's a good question. Um, yeah, it's just a just something to think about. Okay, right. You know we is, missed you, brother Randy. We're oh, glad you're back. Oh, right. That's right. Welcome. Can back. you feel the love? Oh, I can. I can feel. <laughs> you I don't feel the love. Okay. I don't hear no hand clapping or anything like that. No, <laughs> there's no hand claps for you. It's just welcome back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Welcome back, and welcome to the host's wife today. Yes. Thank you. We are honored to have the seat at the table today. And uh, last week, obviously, was the Jimmy Tony episode, which is just, if you haven't listened to it yet, go oh, listen to it. Yes. Ups and downs of ministry. The week yes. before that was Kingdom Business with Mark Copeland. Woo! And yeah, that was Did that light fire. some fires? Uh, that was so good. Flicking through all of the feedback, I had, couldn't help but notice this user uh, named Benjamin Copeland. Oh, really? <laughs> And really? he just said, hashtag hmm. not biased. Oh. <laughs> you said his last name was? Copeland. I Copeland. don't know if okay. that mm-hmm. rhymes. Um, <laughs> I wonder if he's related. I wonder if he's related. Uh, there was so many good, uh, positive uh, pieces of feedback on that episode. Um, a lot of people are still chiming in about the ministerial development episode as well. They want that leather you know, covered the, yes, book. Yes, that's... Um, <laughs> And that's, that's that's gained a bit of traction. Pastor Tanley mentioned that in passing, and everybody is like, "Oh, we want one of those." Yes, yeah, yes. Um, so anyway, there's so many, uh, so many there. I didn't want to read them all, but uh, one user also, or user listener, I should call them, yeah. or Kingdom Speaker, uh, on the Mark Copeland episode said, uh, "So good." When Brother McKillop said, "I've been through the eye of the needle," that was a revelation. Keep it coming. Um, so let's just say amen to all oh, of the yeah. positive input we received. Can I get a oh, amen? Amen. amen? Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah! And um, when people see the title for this episode, oh, this is going to catch some attention. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. it is. So it was earlier um, this summer in the month of August mm-hmm. that we were blessed to have... Um, Bishop Clifford Clark mm-hmm. and uh, his family, brother and sister, Raul was here. Mm-hmm. They were here for our youth conference. And we, uh, man, I, I was in California uh, a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. and repeated references to Bishop Clark's episode. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So when we were talking podcasting and, and kingdom speak and guests, um, they made... A suggestion and made us aware um, that our guest today was was publishing a book um, on Brother Verbal Bean, the man and the minister, and helped connect us with Sister Hodges. Yes. And an extension of that 
is what this show is about today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we are thrilled to have you joining us today, Sister Hodges. Thank you very much, Philip. I'm glad to be here. Really, I am. Yes. We were talking in the pre-show, and we won't we won't get too specific with this, but um, I think arguably she's one of the most mature guests mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that Kingdom Speak has had. Is mm-hmm. that a nice way to say it? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not, I think about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So she, um, you, you, you just published the book. You told us you just received your first yes. shipment yesterday. Uh, yes, I believe. Of- I had received a copy. One copy earlier, but the shipments that we ordered, the first one came in yesterday. Wow. Mm-hmm. That had to be exciting. It is exciting. Oh. Yeah. A little overwhelming because I absolutely don't know what I'm doing, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're slugging along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So um, we, we really are looking forward to this conversation because undoubtedly, and I'm, and I'm, I'm glad to have my wife here today joining us in this conversation as well. Um, Undoubtedly, Sister Hodges, you you were married to one of the um, guiding voices of the apostolic movement Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. is still um, the the verse that comes to mind, he being being dead yet speaketh. uh, Mm -hmm. That's so true, Brother McKillop, and I've thought of that verse many, many times, and it it, had, it came as a surprise to me. Maybe mm-hmm. later on in the podcast, we'll talk about why. Yes, but it was totally unexpected to me, but so gratifying because we lost him at such a young age. His ministry was so powerful. It seemed like um, it seemed like a terrible loss, and I couldn't see any purpose in it. Mm. Oh yes, then, I've been able to see. I think a little purpose in it. Oh wow! Who cares? Wow. Yeah. So what what makes me so excited about this conversation is uh, me personally. You you referenced that he had preached for uh, the McKillops years ago. Yeah. Obviously, that yeah. predates predates me. I wasn't even born until seventy nine. So, but his ministry impacted our church, our region. Yeah. So there's so many that um, know him from mm-hmm. the stage. Mm-hmm. They know him mm. from a distance. Um, they even know him by extension now, but to have the the privilege to talk to someone who uh, was 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 a part of his intimate life, day to day life, is just right. a privilege. And so you referenced um, him being taken at such a young age. Why don't you just take a few moments to um, speak to us about that process, the death, the accident, and 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 how that all unfolded. Um, we were pastoring in Houston, Greensboro Apostolic. Burbel took the church that was actually pioneered by his mother. When he was 17, he and his mother went to Houston, Texas, and each one of them started a church. And they helped each other, and the churches worked together. Wow. And uh, then he gave up his church and evangelized. After five years, we married, evangelized another five years. And then Sister Bean had to uh, resign from her church. They had built a new building and weren't able to make the payments. And the banker said the only way to avoid foreclosure was for her to resign. It was a heartbreaking, horribly heartbreaking thing for her. So Verbal and I went back to Houston, left the evangelistic field, and took the pastorate of the church there. We had been there for 10 years at the time of his death. And... uh, we saw great growth in revival, many wonderful, wonderful things during those 10 years. But at the time, we were going to Lake Charles, I mean, excuse me, uh, De Quincey, Louisiana, okay. on a Saturday evening to, to visit his old bachelor uncle, who was 92 and on just at death's door. So okay. we took the trip over there. And uh, when we arrived at the nursing home where he lived, Uncle Ross, he had already passed. So we just visited with the family and they made funeral arrangements and that kind of thing. Verbal's aunt had ridden with us in the car and our our son, Joel, who was uh, 21 months old at the time. We had two older daughters, but they were with friends 
that we can. And I've thanked the Lord a multitude of times that they were not oh. with us during that. Hmm. After we left the nursing home to go home, we were on a two-lane road, and a drunk driver around at a curve and hit us head on. Oh, Jesus. And uh, Verbal was killed instantly. I was terribly injured. My back and both feet were broken. Uh, Verbal's aunt lived a week, but she never regained consciousness, and she died. And Verbal, with uh, Joel was left with a horrible concussion. He had a black eye for a year. And as a baby, he was almost killed. The doctor told us that Joel's arm was almost pulled off hmm. his body, and hmm. it caused nerve damage. But undoubtedly, when Verbal saw the car coming, he grabbed Joel by the arm. He wasn't in a car seat. He was standing up in the front seat between us. And I have very few memories of the wreck, just a few hmm. hazy things. But uh, while it saved Joel's life, it left him with a permanent uh, injury to his left arm, which he can't use. And it was a horrible, terrible thing. I go into detail about it in the book. <clears throat> it was a while, and there's details along the way, but finally I woke up in a hospital in Lake Charles, and Sister O'Brien was standing on one side of the bed, and Sister Ann Jackson, my dear friend, they were uh, neighboring pastors in the Houston area. It was on the other side. And I could only come to consciousness just for a little while. I started asking about verbal. And Sister O'Brien didn't want to tell me mm. because she was hoping my family could arrive from California and be with me. Okay. But finally, I persuaded her to tell me that uh, verbal had been killed in the accident. And there's just mm. uh, words really are not sufficient. Oh. They were not sufficient. It was a horrible, horrible thing. And we suffered the repercussions of that. For many years, my daughters suffered. There's a, there's a lot of detail about that. <clears throat> um, but somehow we got through the days. And I've always loved the body of Christ. Mm. But during this time, I saw the care and love and concern. They just carried us really wow. spiritually emotionally carried us. My back was broken. Both feet were broken. I was basically helpless. Joel wound up in the hospital for probably two weeks. But uh, people helped us. My family helped us. The church helped us. So were Friend. you were you even able to, to make it to the funeral? No. Wow. And, oh. and going through this and writing this book and bringing up details that I really hadn't thought about in years— and Brother Jimmy Lee has helped me a lot. They were our assistants. Jimmy and Kathy Lee yes. were our assistants in Houston at the time. Okay. And I've gone to him for reference to try to get this all figured out. Verbal was killed on a Saturday, Tuesday, the following, and it just seems impossible, but it's true. The following Tuesday night, we had a memorial service for the saints in our church at Greensboro. And Wednesday was Verbal's funeral. Um, I, I don't know how we did that wow. in less than a week. Hmm. Wow. But we did. Wow. It, it was just amazing and devastating and horrible, but wonderful that we were sustained and helped and kept and taken care of. Wow. That's um, th those those. Those details are are often the you know the the context to tragedy that is that is overlooked. Just the fact that you were not able to make it to the funeral, yeah. you know, the closure yeah. that comes from right. that. The the and, and and I know it seems even a bit um, conflicting to say this, but the comfort that comes from mm -hmm. yeah. a funeral. You know, yes. and for you not to be able to experience that. Do, right. do you feel like it it prolonged the closure for you in, in dealing with I that? I think so. Uh, they did a recording, but it was a poor quality, mm. and I'm, I'm not sure I could even put my hands on it now. But one day at, at home, I found myself alone, and I played that recording. Mm. Wow. And when I did, I just fell apart. 
Mm. I couldn't bear it. I had to turn it off. So it was years before I tried to listen to it again. Finally, years afterwards, I was able to sit and listen to it. But it was it was just heartbreaking in a way that I wasn't strong enough to endure at that sure. time. It was sure. foolish of me to do it by myself. Sure. Probably should have had people around me, but um, I wanted the privacy, mm. but I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I don't like to go to the grave. I don't get mm. any comfort from that. Mm. I know people do, and everybody has to deal with grief in the way that is beneficial sure. to them, right. sure. but it's never been be- beneficial to me. I've never felt like he was there. It's mm. always just been like a horrible place for me. Mm. I very seldom have gone to the grave. Wow. I just, I don't like to think about that part of it. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things, um, Sister Hodges, that makes um, tragedy a bit unique for, for when it strikes a pastor's wife like this is your whole world changes, not just yeah. not just relationally mm-hmm. in the sense that you don't have a spouse. Now you don't have a pastor. Right. Your whole um, your whole day to day life is is transformed. You have to reinvent from the grassroots up. Mm. It shakes everything. I've I've been very um, unhappy with some of the decisions. And, and mostly I made. I had counsel. My parents were there. Friends were there. The O'Briens were there. The Ballesteros were there. Many pe- brother and sister Lee were just fabulous. But um, I had so many decisions to make. Mm. And at that time, I don't know why, maybe my emotional state, I just felt like in order for the church to bond to a new pastor that we would have to move out of the area mm-hmm. because they loved us and they were feeling very protective of the children and me at that time. Mm-hmm. And so we quickly went through the process of getting a pastor. If I had it to do over again, I know mm. those are useless words, aren't they? Mm-hmm. If I had it to do over again, I would have suggested we had Brother Bellastero be a supply pastor for six months and give us a time of healing, yes. give the church a time of healing. Yes. Let us kind of get our feet under us. But it all happened so quickly. And I've I have some real regrets about that. Sure. That but it was like nobody knew what we should do. It was oh, just sure. a strange thing. And a church can't exist without a pastor. So I, I know everybody was doing their best. I know I certainly was trying my hardest. I love verbal so much and I wanted to make sure that his memory and everything was was pristine and that it was all done right. But I have really, really regretted that. And if I could advise anybody who was in a similar circumstance, my advice would be take some time, surround mm-hmm. yourself with supportive people, helpful people, let the church pray, bring in pastors, bring in people to teach and hold the church together mm-hmm. until some sort of sense could be made not yes, yes. not operating emotionally yes. but operating mm. spiritually and operating uh wisely that better decisions could have been made that is, that is, so that is such good advice such good advice you know um i'm i'm not sure and you may be aware uh but randy our producer that's here um, that we were roasting vivaciously a few moments ago. But his grandfather was the the pastor of the church that I'm pastoring now. I see. Uh-huh. And he was killed at 36 years of age in, in a vehicle oh. accident. So oh our, church, our church, again, I, I can't speak with personal experience to it, but mm-hmm. they... They went through exactly mm-hmm. what yeah. what your congregation went through, and I would say basically experienced kind of what you said. They're still here, mm-hmm. thankfully. Mm-hmm. Obviously, yeah. Randy's still here. His grandmother Thanks. is still here, mm-hmm. um, and and God, God's just brought it together in the churches, you know. But to 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 your point, just allowing 
a, 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 a sense of the new normal to right to, to come yes. to that congregation yes and 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 I, I don't even, don't, don't want to say secondly in a sense of primacy but to the to the family that's impacted you know yourself right. your children yes. to uproot them from you know that, that's, had that's some devastating great. effects on my family. But the thing about it is this isn't anything we talk about or have seminars about. What of happens course. if your pastor is killed yeah. by a yeah. we just don't discuss it. Yeah. And so we don't know till we're in that situation. And then of course, when I was in that situation, I was just overwhelmed with so much. Mm. My injuries, Joel's injuries, oh. my daughter's losses. And then when it dawned on me that the church, the saints had lost their pastor, their shepherd, that was like another death. Oh, of course. First of all, I was just wrapped up in my family and my children. Mm -hmm. And then it dawned on me that this congregation that had loved their pastor, it just, I don't know, Brother McKellop, I just, I just know God helps, but I know that he puts a people of God in our lives to carry us mm. when we can't walk. I went through a time that I couldn't pray. I could say prayerful words, but prayer is so emotional. <clears throat> mm. And my feeling was if I gave myself to prayer, that I would lose it. I, I, just, I just felt like I just wasn't strong enough to enter that arena. And so for a period of time, I did very little praying, and what I did was very, very shallow. But I cannot tell you how many people have said to me, Sister Bean, we're praying for you. Sister Bean, our church had special prayer for you last night. Sister Bean, our family prayed for you before we went to bed over and over countless times. And I thought, God had a safety net for me, family. And it was... <laughs> It's wonderful people. Don't get me going on that. <laughs> mm, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've often, um, not to, because this is this is why we're here. We want to hear the story. But I've often wondered when, you know, Jesus looked at Peter and said, I have prayed for you. Yeah. That that your faith wouldn't mm. fail. Yeah. What what greater comfort could be given then that that God would pray for you? I know. And if the church now is the body of Christ. As it is. As it is. When it, when the church is praying for you, that's as close as we can get. Wow. To experiencing what Peter experienced on that moment. Brother McKillop, that's powerful. Mm. You need to preach that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me take that. Down. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's great. <laughs> that is powerful. There is something about the body of Christ that um, I, I don't know. It's unique, and it's special, mm. and it's protective, and it's strong, mm. and it's powerful, and it is held on to the doctrine of God. It's it's pretty amazing. Mm. God has some wonderful children. Wow. So if if we could um, if we could just zoom out, and I appreciate you sharing those details um, with us. So you you referenced a few moments ago that Brother Bean was evangelizing for about five years before yes. y'all were married, mm -hmm. and then um, about five years together before you went right. back. So mm -hmm. many of the, I, I would say for my generation and younger that didn't have the, the privilege of personally knowing Brother Bean, then mm -hmm. we're knowing him by extension through quotes, mm -hmm. references, um, you know, or by his teachings on prayer mm -hmm. and the the works of the Holy Ghost. Yes. So was were, were those teachings done when he was an evangelist or when he was a pastor? Well, he he taught he taught that in his ministry, but he did a fabulous and I know God ordained thing. He started a small Bible school for young ministers there in Houston in our after, church. Oh, okay, okay. After we took, after we went back, and Sister Bean resigned, and Verbal became the pastor. Uh, a few years after that, he was so concerned about 
um, he preached a message about the third generation and there arose a generation which knew not God and, mm. and the works of God. Mm. It was a powerful message. So he had a, a very strong burden that our young ministers have to know God and they have to know the power of God and they have to experience the power of God. So he start, started um, a Bible college there in our church in Houston called uh, Apostolic Ministers Training Institute. And it was just a, a small group of young preachers, and the classes were held at night, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday nights, like from 6.30 to 9 or 10, something like that. And the first subjects he taught were lessons on prayer and then works of the Holy Ghost. And these were recorded. Brother Roy Lawrence came and helped, and actually he was the president of the Bible school, but he and Verbal worked together. Brother Lawrence came and Verbal told him, said, Brother Lawrence, get the best recorder you can find and let's record these lessons. And they recorded those lessons. And that's how those lessons have become so worldwide, wow. known worldwide. Sure. Was And most of the recordings we have now are generations away from that first recording. But okay. but they they recorded those and I know that was the hand of God to preserve mm. those incredible messages on prayer and words mm. of the Holy Ghost mm. and they've gone all around the world now. It wow. it was really astounding. Wow, um, brother brother Bean, you know because. Uh, uh, from my generation, you know, we've we've heard, and 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 it's we're way more connected today than what we would have been, obviously, in previous right. generations. Technology has made the world yes. very small. So, yes. in his day, a hundred soul revival. I mean, hmm. today that's no small thing, but right. it, it that that's something that happened more than once. Throughout his ministry, is or is that you know, the Lord promised verbal uh, early on in his evangelistic world that he would give him the evangelistic ministry that he would give him a one hundred soul revival, mm. and for years, you know, he looked to that. He encouraged the churches. He, it kept his faith up, but it wasn't until his last revival before he took the church in in Houston. He was preaching for Brother Berwick Spell. And God gave him that hundred wow. so Bible. It was 107. But this was in the days, Brother McKellop, when um, it was considered a good revival. And we're not, I'm not putting down anything the Lord sure. does. Sure. Every soul saved is worth the world. Mm -hmm. But they would have revivals of two or three, maybe five, occasionally 10. That yeah. was a powerful revival. Yeah. But God broke through. Mm. with an understanding of what was possible. Mm. And I talk about this in the book, too. You know, Latter Rain had come through, mm. and I don't know if you know anything yes. about Latter Rain. Yes, absolutely. And, and it was such a misuse of the gifts of the Spirit and a mm. misuse of demonstration. It was totally, un, was not under authority. It was just, it was really, really detrimental. So many, many churches pull back from demonstration of works sure. of the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. sure. and all of those things in order not to be labeled or put in a class right. with the parade. Right. So when Verbal started his ministry and teaching and preaching that we can have big revivals, many souls can get the Holy Ghost, it was really controversial. Mm. And it was hard for people to get that out of their mind, but that that you really can have Holy Ghost revival based on biblical truths that turn a church around and turn a city around. So he was a pioneer in that sense. And there were other evangelists during that time, too, mm -hmm. preaching, preaching that and believing that. He wasn't the only one, but he was one of the pioneers. And uh, I, I know they just tore down some strongholds of doubt about what could be accomplished for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. um, to me, he was just uh, a groundbreaking, um, I, I'm not sure 
the right words to describe him, but he just just allowed the Lord to use him and proved that it's just limitless what God can do. So, so obviously, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor and I have verbal being come to preach for me. Uh, you know, what, what does that, he, he was obviously a preacher of faith. Yes. Um, uh, and, but yet did it, did it start? Did these revivals start? Cause this is a part of revival. That's not nearly as popular today that, that started, you know, with rooting out sin and, and, yes. and, you know, so how, how did, how did his revivals play out? Just, just in a, in a quick overview. Okay. Well, first of all, he, he wouldn't go to a revival unless he and the pastor were in agreement in understanding of what all his revival might entail. Oh, um, okay. If there was doubt about it, <laughs> then it's not that, that he was enemies. It's just he knew his ministry was strong and controversial in mm-hmm. some ways. Mm-hmm. And uh, if the pastor didn't have that understanding, then it would be a problem. It wouldn't be a blessing. So, he would only go if he felt like he and the pastor were in understanding about that. But the first thing he did was to teach on prayer, get the church praying. Every revival I know anything about always had 10 o'clock prayer meetings every morning. Mm. And these were powerful, powerful meetings. And of course, the whole church couldn't be there. But if you can get a core group of people who understand intercession, and understand the power of prayer, understand faith, understand the need of freedom of worship. If you can get a core group filled with that information and receive it and participate in it, mm. then you have something to build on. And then, of course, he, he might preach and teach after we prayed, before we prayed. He might sing. It, we never knew how the prayer meetings would be. Sometimes they were hours, sometimes they were two hours. But then the church would come, congregation would come early for church at night, pray again, and then he usually always instituted at least one 24-hour prayer chain that might last a week or two or three weeks. So these revivals were literally saturated in prayer, verbal, learned as a young man, as a young boy. He learned to pray, and had spent hours in prayer as a young person before he ever entered the ministry. So prayer, Holy Ghost prayer, was a was a foundation of his ministry, and he taught wow. it every. That that is so, so good. How how long would these revivals last? Was you know I mean you don't no. you don't do that in uh, three weeks. No, no, you don't. They could, last, they could last nine weeks, 12 weeks. I think the longest I heard was maybe 14 weeks. Wow. And how, that's how often have in church? Every night ah, wow. until, until the revival broke. And then maybe you could have Monday nights off. It's astounding. It, it's astounding. That was another age. Most women didn't hold jobs, but still. It was a huge commitment for church, but when they did, uh, Brother McKillop, mm. things happened. It was just that saturation night after night. Just we're not moving in this service until we get direction from the Holy Ghost. We're going to sit here and wait for the Lord till God's ready to speak. And that was another thing that people expected a sermon every night. Well. Oh. Wasn't always a sermon. I, w- I was going to refer to that. So, <laughs> um, you know, you we've heard this of people traveling hours to go hear brother brother Bean preach and being so frustrated yes. that he didn't preach. Yes. So, so that's yes. a fact. Oh my word! God bless him, but he was determined, brother Kellett, to be led by the Spirit mm. because he knew his mere his ministry was dependent on supernatural intervention. Mm -hmm. If he did not have that, then he couldn't have revival, not the way he was. So he was so dependent on the moving of the Holy Ghost that he just couldn't move forward in his service until he felt like that he was in the vein of the Spirit and following what Well, that's terminology that we don't hear a lot anymore, sadly. Sadly. The vein of the Spirit. 
wow. writing this book, talking about those services, how he would get up there and say, church, we need to pray. We need to pray. Everybody's <laughs> in one of his uh, lessons. He says, I could just hear everybody saying under their breath, preach, preach, preach. Uh -huh. No, we're, we're not going to move forward till we hear from God. We have to hear from God. And that was controversial. And it was new, I think, in most cases. Well, and I, I think keeping it within the context of the latter rain movement. Yes. Mm. Yes. I, I, could, I could see an added veil of, of controversy yes. to that. You know, he's, he's, he's being sucked in by this. He was amazing. He wow. was a precious, precious man. So you, you've, you've, made, you've made reference a couple of times to the presentation that God could give a hundred soul revival being yes. controversial. Yes. Um, the fact that he didn't preach every service and, and that was controversial. So can, yes. you, can you speak a bit to what the climate of the apostolic movement was, was like in that day, I mean, if latter rain was ripping through, um, then what what was the what was the the church climate like? At, at it was moment? difficult, Brother McKellar. It was very difficult. Of course, I wasn't there for the first years of Verbal's ministry, but um, but when churches pray, when the evangelist understands and knows how to follow the will of God, after things start happening healings and Holy Ghost infillings and and a church that had never understood the power of worship, worship and running the aisles. Those things were so um, powerful mm. and exciting that people were willing to, this may not be the right terminology, but were willing to put up with the things, other things, uh, verbals, Preaching could be very, very hard. But in the book, I found a quote where he talks about hard preaching. He said, I don't preach hard because other preachers are preaching hard. He said, I won't preach a hard message mm. until I've got it in my spirit. He said, one time I had to pray three hours before I got it in my spirit and, and the Lord could use me. And then he said, when you preach a hard message with tears and you're not lambasting people, they will receive it. Wow. Well, I've, I've often um, said this, and, and, and it was more of a, of a um, wondering, a, a, an expression of a wondering. You know, I've heard people, and it, it's, it's, it's not uncommon to hear your preachers quoting verbal being, you know, yes. in, in, in conferences yes. and right. venues and, you know, massive meetings. And I've, I've asked myself this, well, it's easy to quote verbal being, but I, I wonder if this conference could handle verbal being. You know, Brother McKillop, that's really true. That is really, really true. If people, if they didn't have a knowledge of uh, verbal sincerity and his true walk with God, that mm -hmm. it, he, he came under some criticism. He did come under some criticism. Mm -hmm. He came under some misunderstanding. And those, those were painful. But, but he was, like I said, he was careful to only go in revivals, of course, number one, that he felt like it was in the perfect will of God, but also that the pastor understood what, what this might entail. Yes. And it was it was hard when he started digging out sin and, and things like that. It got tense. But honestly, people wouldn't, they kept coming. Even though some of these services seemed to be difficult, they didn't want to miss because God. Wonderful things were happening, and altars were filling up, and backsliders were praying through. Brother Tommy Jackson told me about the Silsby Revival, which was before we were married. It turned that community around, and Verbal started uh, preaching against rings, mm. which 
was controversial then and controversial now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and some of the women whose husbands were not saved were pulling off their rings. I mean, I'm not Ooh. sure I realized that, but yeah. they did. Yeah. And one man, one unsaved husband came to church with a gun. Brother Jackson said he, he, he was intending on shooting verbal. And when he came to that service, he got the Holy Ghost. It's just, hmm. <laughs> it's just amazing, amazing, amazing. Wow. Yeah. What What would be some of um, from from your your closeness to him and 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 the inside uh, view of of his ministry? What's some of your favorite stories of? while you're on the evangelistic field, or or even pastoring, where his ministry, just seeing God use use the man. What are... What are, what are well, uh, I'd, I'd have to take a minute to search my memory to, to pull sure. that out, but I know he had a powerful revival in um, Port Arthur, Texas, with Brother Berber. Mm. That yes. church, um, I th- I'm... I'm choosing my words carefully, but if my understanding is that it, in some ways it was a board run church yes, and I think they had the pastor on a salary Okay, and verbal went in and dealt with that. He had a dream of a 17 foot snake in the aisle of that church. And he dealt with that, that old uh, thing where the board is in control mm. and somehow God used him through that to break that loose and change the, administration of that church and brother burr would tell anybody who listened oh, for that sure. revival changed the trajectory of that church but would you like to know what he was like as a husband and a father yes yes, <laughs> yes that's what yes. we want to know <laughs> one reason i wanted to write this book was because many many people are very knowledgeable about verbal's ministry and they've heard the tapes, and sure. uh, they've followed him. And I'm so, so grateful for that. But I am here to say that as awesome a preacher and evangelist and prophet as he was, he was also just that awesome as a father and a wow. husband and a son. He was so loving and kind, Brother McKillop. He did not talk about people all of the years of our marriage i never remember him speaking d- disparagingly about mm. any other minister he was careful about the words he said but he was also loving and generous to me when we first married we didn't have money but what little we had if i said verbal jenna needs shoes he never fussed about it. He never complained to me about it. And he would let me buy her really nice shoes, even though we were practically broke. Wow. He was so kind and tender and loving. He was funny. He really? would tease. Oh, he would tease. And I tell a story in the book. I'm running this book for everybody. But my daughter, Jennifer, my our second daughter was probably five or six, and we were living out on 20 acres in a in a uh, mobile home. We were going to build a home, which was not yet built. Mm. But Verbal had cattle. He loved all that. And horses. First thing he built on that 20 acres was a huge barn, <laughs> and I never let him forget it. He <laughs> built the barn first. <laughs> but he had an old dump truck, and Jennifer and her good friend holly spent the day building a village in that dump truck they brought in toys they brought in supplies all day long they were in and out of the trailer building this village with their dolls and their toys in the bed of this dump truck and it was just a wonderful day for them and verbal came by and they didn't know it but he saw what they were doing Hmm. and he got in the dump truck And very slowly, he drove them all around the property to look at the cattle and all of that. They thought they had just died and gone to heaven. He pulls the dump truck back close to the house. And while they were sitting there at the slowest possible speed, he starts raising the bed. (laughs) (laughs) I 
think we know where this is going. <laughs> right to the ground. <laughs> Those girls were just, they could not believe he had done such a thing. And he thought it was just the funniest thing in the world. There was that side of him too. <laughs> wow. It was not too much trouble if the children needed something. He was careful to take us on a vacation every year so we could. could. He was such a family man. He loved our children. Oh, my goodness. He was such a good friend, a good brother, a wonderful husband. I just could not tell you how much I love that man. He was wow. so good. Wow. He was kind and gentle. He never shouted at me one time in our marriage. I never went to him and told him he did something he would fuss because I was spending too much money. Never. And so that, I wanted people to see that side of him too. Sure. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Sweet guy. So that's the that's part of the purpose of the book is to yes. present yes. that side mm -hmm. of him as a husband. About our romance, which oh. is pretty exciting. It was a time it looked like it wasn't going to happen, and uh, we really had a we really had a supernatural event. I won't talk about it now, mm. but uh, it was something. You're going to make them buy the book. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> ah, I love <laughs> well, it. Well, I don't it's have working. time to tell it. Uh -huh. So, were you were you in the same church? Not trying to no, not trying to no. be the evil reporter that pulls it out of you and gets you saying what you don't want to say. But no, mo no, uh, I lived in San Jose, California, where my dad pastored a church. Actually, he pioneered that work in San Jose. Oh wow! Okay. My, my uncle, James Kilgore, was mother's younger brother, 10 okay. years younger. Okay. He pastored in Houston, Texas, and um, he, he had a good church, but it wasn't a revival church like he wanted to see. And he go, Uncle James went into some real desperate travail where he just shut himself away to pray for revival. And soon after that, Verbal was between revivals. But he, his mother lived in Houston. That's where Verbal had lived before he started evangelizing. So when he went home, it was to Houston. Okay. And one Sunday night, he decided to visit Uncle James' service. And while he was there, Uncle James asked him to preach. And he preached that night, and it was a fabulous service. And a man in that church, and I won't call names because I might get it wrong, mm. but my understanding was he had been seeking the Holy Ghost for like 14 years, and he got the Holy Ghost that night mm. and started that revival. In the meantime, my grandfather, who was in San Antonio, Texas, had a heart attack. So mom and dad and I traveled from San Jose to San Antonio so we could be with granddad. While we were there, Uncle James comes over from Houston to be with the family. And then he takes me home with him. And he said to me, you're going to love my evangelist. And so I went to be with the Kilgores. And actually, I was dating a young preacher at that time. I was 17. Oh! <laughs> and when I went into service that night and saw Verbal, he was just so astoundingly handsome <laughs> but i mean that was enough but then when he started preaching i was absolutely blown away by his ministry so anointed so I, and handsome like oh god this is this and is could a combination sing. and could sing and quote scriptures by the pages wow. wow but you know i was 17 a high school senior he's a seasoned evangelist and i just fell in love with him well of course, he wasn't in love with me, and we fellowshiped after church, and and Imogen Kilgore thought we would be a great pair. Well, Verbal thought it was funny. Oh. You know, he knew what they were trying to do. So anyway, it was a long story. Oh. <laughs> uh, buy the book. Yes. Now you got my wife wanting to buy the book for I sure. I do. Yeah. <laughs> We're over all all us ministers over here buying prayer and works of the Holy Ghost. All our wives over here buying romance stories from. <laughs> well, those things are important too, aren't they, Sister McKillop? <laughs> Absolutely, you got to know the background. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, an interesting note is our son actually just went through your husband's book last year in Bible class at school. 
So oh, really? He heard about what we were doing today. He is excited. He's like, Mom, oh. I want to read that book. So I'm buying oh. one for me and one for my son. <laughs> well, that's good. He's 17. Are you going to try to... Yeah, we know why he wants to read the yeah. book. Oh. He wants to learn some this, romance this could tricks from, from Brother Bean. <laughs> this, <yeah. laughs> we'll learn about more than prayer. Right? Well, our courtship was unique. I'm not sure it'll follow those those same patterns, but maybe. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Are there are there any other uh, little tidbits that you want to throw? out to our audience that might incite a little more interest. That one, that last one was a pretty good hook. That's good. That's a pretty good hook. Um, <laughs> before we wrap up today, any other insights that you well, could Well, verbal, verbal could be so, and when it was a solemn service, I'm telling you there's nobody in the world that would be more intense and focused, and there was nothing to laugh about it. But then other times... He would be jovial in the pulpit, a little bit mocking. I'm not sure that's the right word about people who wouldn't be willing to worship and shout because they might mess up their hair or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, mm -hmm. he, he had such a wide range in his ministry. It was pretty astounding if you just heard one of those sermons and based his whole ministry on that, you would be wrong because yes. wow. it was it was so such diverse. Diverse, exactly. And yes. he was a wonderful Bible teacher. And um, as a child, they lived in poverty out in the woods. He never had a church. His mother got the Holy Ghost by somebody coming through doing like brush arbor meetings and things like that, home meetings. Wow. His mother got the Holy Ghost. His father never lived for the Lord. Um, but Verbal spent hours of prayer in the woods and as a as a boy and his family they there were four children he was the youngest of four two lived for the lord two never did the father never lived for the lord the mother always did so from that standpoint they were a divided family but he and his older sister and his mother they they learned long passages of scripture that's what they did they didn't have a pastor. They didn't have a church to go to. And he and his sister and mother would have scripture quoting contests in the evenings. Wow. Each one of them would quote a scripture, and this would go on and on and on and on till one of them couldn't remember another scripture to quote. That that was part of the basis of his of his ministry and his life. And because they were poor and because they lived in the country, there was very little um, amusement available to them. And he learned to pray as a child, and he spent hours in prayer. It wasn't until his father died when Verba was 14, and the family moved to Orange, Texas. That was the first time Verba had had a pastor and a church really? in his life. Hmm. And Brother Stanton was the pastor wow. there in Orange, Texas. And Verbal wrote about that time in his life, how he loved, loved to go to church. He would never miss a service. He said one time, even if I had to ride a rickety old bus to get there, I would not miss a service. It was so wonderful to me to have a pastor, to have a church family. And every Sunday, as a young man, he spent the day at the church fasting and praying, learning to play the piano. He already could play the guitar and the mandolin. But then he tells about how an hour before church, the men would come together to pray and how glorious that was for mm. him mm. to have people to pray with. Then he said they would come out of that prayer a room shouting and worshiping the Lord and have wonderful, wonderful church. Wow. For three years, he lived there in that under the pastorate of Brother Stanton, and they were golden years to him because he had a church family. He had a pastor. It, it was just amazing. Then when he was 17, he and his mother moved to Houston, Texas, and they each started a church. I think I've mentioned that. Yes. And they helped oh, wow. each other. It, it's just it's a pretty amazing ministry. Pretty wow. amazing. 
It's it's interesting um, you referencing his musical abilities and his ability to sing. One of the recordings that he, uh, this is one thing that, that s- sticks out to me, where he's talking about the importance of being able to separate the human spirit from the inspiration that God gives. Mm-hmm. And that he said he had the ability because of his musical talent to go in to a place and if he was just feeling melancholy himself mm-hmm. he said I could I could I could sing in a way that I got that church in a melancholy mood and if it was if if it wasn't if it wasn't the will of God for it to be so it was just an extension of his human emotion right. uh-huh. that he could get them in a hole that he couldn't get them out of <laughs> <laughs> And I may not be exactly quoting that exactly yeah, right, yeah, but I know that what, was the yeah. inference, you know. If you, if you let your human spirit yes. uh, guide a service, you might take them a place you don't want them to go. Exactly, <laughs> right. exactly. So, you know, that that in and of itself is a side of the ministry of verbal being that is lost probably on a lot of people. He was yeah. musical. He was musical. He had a beautiful singing voice, and he loved to sing. And um, in most of his revivals, he would ask the pastor to get the O.C. Thompson songbooks. Okay. And a lot of these were new songs, and a lot of them were songs Brother Thompson wrote. And he would have, when he felt like it was time, he would have the church, if they were willing, to come early. He would meet with them before church, teach them these new songs. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with these songs like He Wrote My Name. Mm-hmm. And Heaven's Jubilee. Mm, yes. The, these these were wonderful, wonderful songs. <laughs> and he did that. And then he would he could play the piano or the guitar and teach the music. But then the music people of the church were also learning this, the song leader. And then the song leader would step in and it, it would just it would bring uh it would lift the worship. Mm. It would lift the con- congregation because of these new powerful anointed fresh songs wow. but really holy ghost songs yes and he he loved to sing in a trio he loved music he was very very gifted musically he never had any teaching or instruction if he had he probably could have been a fabulous fabulous musician sure. but he played the piano a little bit of um a little bit kind of like I, I probably shouldn't say this don't quote me <laughs> it's just us. You can say it. <laughs> just kind of a little bit that Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Which you would never think of him with that type of music, but I sure. guess that's all all he heard. And then in mm-hmm. in our life, in our daily life, he never listened to anything but gospel music. Okay. He never listened to worldly music. None sure. of that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What a guy. He was such a sweetheart. Such I, a sweetheart. I want to ask one more thing before we close up. And that's, that's I want to bring you back to uh, your open one of your opening statements. And that is that when the accident happened, you 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 couldn't see any purpose in it. Like why would God no. allow? But no. that later on in your life you felt like God um answered that for you. Could you just speak to that as as we wrap this interview up? At that time in his life, Verbal was uh, controversial. We had been pastoring for 10 years there in Houston, so he hadn't been evangelizing, but he was still controversial. And then there was the split. We, we really shouldn't call it a split. It was like a splinter mm-hmm. when that that separated from the UPC sure. and became the AMF. Yes. And Verbal had been dropped by the UPC. I go a little bit into the book about this. And he was a part of the AMF which was really, really controversial Mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, There was a lot of criticism of it. And so it never occurred to me when Verbal was killed that he might become an icon because there was still that controversial feeling about the division, the split between the EC and the AMF. So when it started happening, I was totally unprepared for it Mm. and to think that this man who people pastors wouldn't have had him in their pulpit maybe i don't want to sound judgmental judgment about that 
But all of a sudden, young men are listening to his tapes and they're understanding his ministry and how powerful it was. And when the copies of Works of the Holy Ghost and Prayer, it just went around Pentecost and around the world. It was just kind of shocking to me. Wow. It was a surprise to me. But I was so thankful and grateful mm -hmm. to know that his ministry was living on. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't know if he had lived, if it would have been that same response. I don't know. I don't know the workings of God about that. Sure. I sure. wouldn't make a judgment call on that at all. But it was just amazing to see that even now, all of these years later, sure. everywhere I yes. go, I hear when they find out that I was married to Verbal, oh, Sister Hodges, I've listened to his tapes on prayer, changed my life. A man told Brother Jimmy Lee, he said, a dead man taught me to move in the works of this Holy Ghost. Mm. Oh, mm. wow. So there has been that um, wonderful, wonderful knowledge that his ministry lives. Yes. Mm. yes. And like you said, and I've thought of that so often, he being dead yet speaking. I'm so, so grateful for that. So very grateful for that. Wow. Thankful to the Lord. Wow. So great. This has been this has been exceptional, Sister Hodges, mm. and we um we really appreciate you coming on Kingdom Speak and sharing. Mm. Uh pulling the veil back a bit and letting us see a, a little bit more about the man and the ministry of verbal. I love being. to talk about verbal. Wow. I love to bring up those memories and absolutely. Uh, and so thank you for this opportunity. So God bless you. Glad to meet you all. Well, thank you so much, Sister Hodges. We have been blessed to have this opportunity today. I feel like you've allowed us to go into the deep places that I know are not easy sometimes to talk about or to write about, but many will be blessed by your thank book. You. Absolutely. 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 Praying that God will bless you for what you have done. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Well, so, it was a it was a blessing to pull up those memories. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I would just fall over on the keyboard and weep and weep just mm -hmm. with the memory and the glory of those services and uh, the sweetness of verbal and living with him and his kindness and care. And then there's funny stuff in there too. Wow. <laughs> he was a jokester, <laughs> as the dump truck story reveals <laughs> yeah, I love absolutely it. <laughs> so they can go to uh, www.verbalbean.com yes to uh -huh. pick up that book yes and they can go to facebook okay and it'll be i think under joel bean okay. i'm not sure i'm really so tech ignorant <laughs> and it's hey. one of those things i don't want to learn i've had to learn a little bit to survive in this world, but yes, I do. don't like it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but so, this is fabulous, and it's just occurred to me that through the Internet, not only ha are horrible things happening, but the gospel of God is, is being yes. spread around the world. It's amazing. It is. I have it a is. friend teaching women in China, and they have translating abilities. Is that amazing? And she taught them Bible studies, and then she sent out a text, can anybody baptize these people? It's just amazing. So there is that, too. Thank Absolutely. the Lord. Well, yeah. that's our prayer and that that's what doing. happens today. Absolutely. Yes. yes. These podcasts. Yeah. So. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, oh. Well, it's been a privilege, and we, we want to encourage our audience to uh, go to verbalbean.com or look up uh, Joel being on Facebook and go ahead and get your copy of this book. You will be blessed. Yes. And um, thank you again for being with us today. God bless you.